we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. There is great beauty in being totally anonymous, and the whole world is seeking identity, power, position. Hello and welcome to episode 94 of Urgency of Change. Each weekly episode in this season of the Krishnamurti podcast is based on a major theme of the philosopher's talks, such as freedom, self-knowledge, beauty, intelligence and meditation. Extracts from our archives have been carefully selected to represent Krishnamurti's different approaches to each of these universal and timelessly relevant themes. This week's theme is anonymity. Upcoming themes are religion, love and conditioning. This podcast is brought to you by Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please see our official YouTube channel for hundreds of video and audio recordings of Krishnamurti's full talks and shorter extracts. We are a non-profit charity and rely on your support to continue to preserve and make Krishnamurti's work available. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This week's episode on anonymity and creativity has four sections. The first extract is from Krishnamurti's third question and answer meeting in Ojai, 1980, titled In Anonymity is True Creativity. What is true creativity? And how is it different from that which is celebrated in popular culture? What is generally called creativity is mostly man-made. Painting, music, literature, both romantic and factual, all the architecture, the marvellous technology, And all those who are involved in all this, the painters, the writers, the poets, the philosophical writers, probably consider themselves as creative. And we all seem to agree with them. That's the popular idea of what is a creative person. We agree to that? I think we all see that. That all man-made things most beautiful, the great cathedrals, temples and (coughs) Islamic mosques, are extraordinarily, some of them are extraordinarily beautiful. I don't know if you have seen them. And if you have, they are really ex- marvellous. And <clears throat> the people who built these were anonymous. They, we don't know who built them. With the, They were only concerned with building, writing, the Bible, all that. Nobody knows who wrote them. 
But now, with us, anonymity is almost gone. And perhaps with anonymity there is a different kind of crea- creativity. It is not based on success, money, and uh, 28 million books sold in 10 years, and so on and so on. The speaker himself at one time tried anonymity. Because the speaker doesn't like all this fuss and nonsense. He tried to talk behind a curtain. <laughs> and it became rather absurd. So anonymity has great importance. You, in that there is a different quality, different... Uh, this personal motive doesn't exist. The personal attitudes and personal opinions, it is a feeling of freedom from which you are acting. But most creativity, as we call it, is man-made. That is, this creation, this creation takes from the known. Right? The known. The great musicians, Beethoven, Bach and so on. It is from the known, the act. And the writers, philosophers, and so on, also have, have read, accumulated, developed their own style, and so on, always moving or acting or writing from that which has been accumulated known. And this we call generally creativity. Now, is there is that really creative? Please, let's talk about it. Or is there a different kind of creativity which is born out of the freedom from the known? You understand? Me? Because when we paint, write, create a marvellous structure out of stone. It is the accumulated knowledge, whether in the scientific field or in the world of art, human art, there is always this sense of carrying from the past to the present. Or sudden, (laughs) or imagination, romantic, factual, modern, and so on. Is there is their creativity something totally different from this? activity that we call generally creativity. We are asking, I think it's a rather important question to go into, if you are willing, whether the, there is an action, there is a living, there is a movement which is not from the known. That is there a creation from a mind that is not burdened from all the turmoils of life, 
from all the social pressures, economic and so on, is there a creation out of the out of a mind that has freed itself from the known? And it can then use memory. You understand what I mean? Knowledge. But we start with knowledge, and that we call creative. But we are suggesting that there is a creativity which is not born out of the known. When that creative impulse or movement takes place, it can then use the known, but not the other way around. I don't know if you are following what I am saying. You, if you don't mind some time, try or be in a... Find out whether the mind can ever be free from the known. The known being all the accumulated experience, remembrance, the knowledge that one has acquired, the impressions and so on. To, but that can, the mind can be free from all that. And in that very state of mind, Creation, as we know it, may not be necessary. You understand? A man who has a talent for writing feels he must express himself. He develops his own style. The way he writes, Keats, Eliot and so on, and the others, they have this impulse to write, fulfil, create. Perhaps their own lives are rather not all that beautiful. Like Michelangelo, Raffaello and all those people. Sorry to quote these names, <laughs> I'm not learned. But I visited many museums when I was young. I was pushed into it all that. <laughs> and the remnants of all that remains. And I have talked to a great many artists, writers, friends and so on. It seems to me, it seems to that all our creation in the scientific world, in all human art, it is always from a point, from a talent, from a gift. And that gift is exploited to its fullest extent, like a musician who has a gift, a prodigy. He, you know, becomes tremendously important. And we, common people, admire all that and wish we had some of that. As we haven't got it, we run after them. We almost worship them, the conductors, the music, and all the game that goes on. And when you begin to question what is creativity, as the questioner is asking, is it something totally different, which I think we all can have? Not the specialists, not the professionals, not the talented, gifted. I think we can all have this extraordinary 
mind that is really free from all the burden which man has imposed upon himself, created for himself. And then out of that sane, rational, healthy life, something totally different comes. And that may be not necessarily be expressed as a, in painting, architecture. What should one? You follow? You, if you are gone into this fairly deeply, and I hope you will, you will find out that there is a state of mind which actually has no experience whatsoever. Because experience implies a mind that is still groping, asking, seeking, and therefore struggling in darkness and wanting to go beyond it. But a mind that is very clear. not confused, has no conflict, has no problem, has no problem, you try. Such a mind, it's no need to express talk or... I'm talking, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The speaker is talking not because he wants to impress you or anything of that kind, which is too silly, or persuade you to certain attitudes and opinions and judgments. It's a kind of friendly communication with two people who are concerned with all this enormous complex life. who haven't found an, a complete, total answer to all this. And there is a complete and total answer if we apply our minds, our hearts to this. So there is a creativity which is not man-made. Don't please say that's God-made. That's, that has no meaning either. Because if, if our own minds are extraordinarily clear, without a shadow of conflict, then out of that mind is really in a state of creation, which needs no expression, no fulfilment, or all that publicity and nonsense. The second extract is from the fourth talk at Brookwood Park in 1978, titled Total Anonymity and Humility. When one has come to a certain point, the senses can develop extrasensory perception, can be, because they become extraordinarily sensitive, telepathy, read some one other people's thoughts, control various forms of clairvoyance and so on and so on. They are still within the field of the senses, right? So they have, they have not this colossal importance that man is giving to them. Right? I wonder if you see this. 
speaker has been through all this. Forgive me for entering personally. One has been through all this. And one sees the danger of it. Caught in all that sensory excitement, all that. It's stupid. So, though these things there are, definitely, but they are irrelevant. We are asking now another question, which is, man is always seeking power, right? The politicians, the priests, the everyday man and woman it wants to dominate, wants to control, wants to possess. Power has become extremely important. The two superpowers, that means power in the hands of the few to dictate what others should think. The Christian Church has done this excellently at one time. The heretics, the torture, the Inquisition, and all that, to control man through propaganda, through books, through words, through images, controlling him through his fear and reward and punishment. Any form of dissent is either tortured, expelled, concentration camps, or burnt. Right? This is history of man's stupidity, though he calls it patriotic, religious. Now we are asking, is it possible to live without any sense of power? You understand what I am saying? Are you following all this interest in all this? Which means, can you live in total anonymity and total humility? You may have a name, may write a book, or talk like you are doing, and be somewhat famous or notorious, whatever you like to use the word, but nothing behind it. So, so you are not seeking power through clairvoyance, through telepathy, to all this can be used by governments to control the captain in the submarine. They are all experimenting with all this, for God's sake, aware of all this. And can one live without any sense of power? You know, there is a great beauty in that, to be totally anonymous. When the whole world is seeking identity, power, position. Now, next question is, can the brain, please listen to this, can the brain, which is million, millions and millions years old, so heavily conditioned, so full of of all that a man has collected through centuries, and therefore is acting mechanically all the time, can that brain be free from the known, and can that brain never, never get old, old in the sense physically? You understand what I am talking about? Don't you ask these questions? Do you? Perhaps you do when you get old, when you are somewhat decrepit. 
when you have lost your capacity to think, you're losing your memory, and then you say, oh my God, I wish I could go back and be young again, to have a fresh mind, young mind, decisive mind. Don't you ask this sometimes? Whether this brain can lose its burden and be free and never deteriorate. Don't say yes or no, find out. Which means, please listen if you want to be interested in this, which means never psychologically register anything. Right? Is that, you understand? Never to register the flattery, the insult, the various forms of impositions, pressures. Never to keep the tape completely fresh. Then it is young. Innocence means a brain that has never been wounded. Right? That is innocence, that has no snow, misery, conflict, sorrow, pain, all that, which is all registered in the brain, and therefore it's always limited, old as it grows, physically older. Whereas if there is no recording whatsoever, psychologically, then the brain becomes extraordinarily quiet, extraordinarily fresh, this is not a hope, this is not a reward. Either you do it and discover it, or you just accept words and feel how marvellous that must be. I wish I could experience that, and you're off the mark. Whereas if you do it, you'll find out. So the brain then becomes, because of this insight, which we talked about, because of that insight, the brain cells undergo a change. It's no longer holding to memories. It's no longer the house of vast collected antiquity. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's seventh talk in Sanin, 1961, titled Creativity and the Still Mind. You try sometime this, a simple thing, go out when you go out for a walk, be attentive. Then you will see that you hear see much more than the brain that is concentrated. Because attention is a state of not knowing, therefore inquiring. Inquiring without a cause, inquiring without a motive. which is pure research, which is the really scientific mind. It may have knowledge, but that knowledge doesn't interfere with inquiry. Therefore, an attentive mind can concentrate, 
But that concentration is not a resistance, not an exclusion. Yeah, you're following some of you this? So, from that, when there is this attention, this attention which is a state of mind, which is not crammed with information, knowledge, experience, a state of mind that does not, that is, that lives in not knowing, Which means that the mind has, the brain and the mind have completely discarded every influence, edict, sanction, have un, has understood authority, has dissolved ambition, envy, greed. and is totally opposed to society and all its morality. It does no longer follow anything. Such a mind then can proceed to inquire. To inquire profoundly requires silence. If I want to look at those mountains and listen to the stream as it rushes by, if I want to see, if I want to listen, not only the brain must be quiet, but also the entire ma mind, with all its unconscious and conscious, it must be entirely quiet to look. Shall I? But if the brain is chattering, if the mind is wants to grasp, hold, become great, then it is not seeing, it is not listening to the beauty of the sound of a stream as it rushes by. So, inquiry implies freedom and sight. You see, people have written about a silent mind through meditation, concentration. There are volumes written about it, not that I have read any of them. People have come and talked to me about it, how to train the mind to be silent, which is sheer double nonsense. You can't train to be silent, then you are dead, you are conforming. Then you are in a state of decay. Like everything that conforms through fear, through greed, through envy, through ambition, is a dead, dull, stupid mind. And this dull, stupid mind can become very quiet, but it'll never en inquire, it'll never discover, it'll to it nothing can come new. It remains still a petty, small mind, which is very quiet. So, 
So, a mind that is attentive is without conflict. Therefore, free. And so a mind, such a mind is quiet, silent. I do not know if any of you have gone so far if you have And what we have been talking about is meditation. If you have gone so far in self-knowing, then you will find that a silent mind is not a dead mind. It is extraordinarily active. Not the activity of achievement. <coughs> Not the activity which is adding and subtracting, going, coming, becoming. Because it is still, it is intensely active. Because in that activity, it, that activity has come into being without any seeking, without any compulsion, without any effort, without denying anything. Because all along it has understood everything, every phase of its being. There has been no suppression of any kind, therefore no fear, no imitation, no conformity. And with, if, you, if the mind has not done all these things, there can be no silent mind. Now, now what happens after? So far, one has used words to communicate, but the word is not the thing. The word silence is not silence. So please proceed, understand this. So, the word is not the thing. And the mind must be free of the word in order to be, so that the mind is still. Now, when the mind is actually still, and therefore intensely active and free, and isn't concerned with communication, with expression, with achievement, then there is creation. That creation is not vision. Christians have visions of Christ. 
The Hindus have visions of their own little gods or big gods. Those visions are the outcome of their conditioned life. All the Christian saints have always everlastingly had visions of Jesus and Virgin Mary. So do the Hindus. They are reacting to their conditioning. They are projecting their visions. And what they see is from their born, from their background. And what they see is not fact, but their wishes, their desires, their longings, their hopes. But a mind that is attentive and silent has no vision. as it has freed itself from all the conditioning influences, from all churches, dogmas, religions, ideas. Therefore, such a mind knows what, I- what it is, what is creation, not the musician that paint that plays or the painter or the man who has capacity to put words together into a poem but creation is entirely different Then, if you have gone as far as that, then you will see that there is a state of mind which is without time. Without space. And therefore, Seeing or receiving something which is not measurable, and what is seen and felt and experiencing is of the moment and not to be stored away. So that reality, which is not measurable, which is unnameable, which has no word, comes into being only when the mind is completely free and silent and is in a state of creation. The state of creation is not just alcoholic or stimulated, but when one has understood and gone through this self-knowing and is free from all the reactions of envy, ambition and greed, then you will see that creation is always new and therefore always destructive. And creation can never be within the framework of society, within the framework of a limited individuality. Therefore, the limited individuality seeking reality has no meaning. And when there is that creation, there is total destruction of everything that one has gathered 
and th therefore there is always the new. And the new is always the true, which is measured. The final extract this week is from the fourth talk in Amsterdam, 1968, titled Become Completely Anonymous. An order means beauty. There is so little beauty in our life. And beauty is not man-made. It's not in the picture, however modern it is or however ancient. It's not in the building, in the statue, in the cloud or on the leaf or on the water. Beauty is where there is order, a mind that is utterly unconfused, that is absolutely orderly. And there can be order only when there is total self-denial, when the me has no importance whatsoever, and the ending of the me is part of meditation. That is the major, the only meditation. And also we have to understand another phenomena of life, which is death. Old age, disease and death accidentally, through disease or through no natural. We grow old inevitably. And that age is shown in the way we have lived our life. It shows in our face how we have satisfied crudely brutally our appetite. We lose sensitivity, the sensitivity that one has had when one is very young, fresh, innocent. And as we grow older, we become insensitive, dull, unaware, and gradually enter the grave. So there is old age, and there is this extraordinary thing called death, of which most of us are dreadfully frightened. If we are not frightened, we have rationalized this phenomena intellectually and have accepted the edicts of the intellect, but it's still there. And obviously there is the ending of the organism, the body, and we accept that naturally, because we see everything dying. But what we do not accept is the psychological ending, the me with the family, with the house, with the success, the things I have done, the things I have to do, the fulfilments and the frustrations, and there is something more to do before I end. 
And the psychological entity, the me, the I, the soul, the various four words that we give to this centre of my self, as my being, we are afraid that will come to an end. Does it come to an end? Does it have a continuity? And the East has said it has a continuity. Reincarnation, born, being born, uh, perhaps if you have lived rightly better, next life. And you have here other forms of resurrection and new way of in all that. After all, if you believe in reincarnation as the whole of Isra does, I don't know why they do, but they do, because it gives them a great deal of comfort. If you do believe in that idea, then it, in that idea is implied, if you observe it very closely, that what you do now, every day matters tremendously. Because the next life you are going to pay for it or be rewarded, what, how you have lived. So what matters is not what you believe will happen next life, but what you are, how you live. And that's implied also when you talk about resurrection. You have symbolized it in one person and worship that person. Because you know yourself you don't know how to, rebo- re- to be reborn again in, in your life now, not in heaven, in the right hand of God or left hand, or behind or forward of God, whatever that may mean. So what matters is how you live now, not what you think, what you, your beliefs are, what your dogmas, superstitions, what your achievements are, but what you are, what you do. And, af- and we are afraid that this centre called the I should come to an end. And we say, does it come to an end? If you have lived in thought, please listen to this, if you are lived in thought, that is when you have given tremendous importance to thinking, and thinking is old, thinking is never new, thinking is the continuation of memory. If you have lived there, obviously some kind of continuity there is, and it is a continuity that is, that is dead, over, finished, something old. Therefore, only that which ends can have something new. So dying is very important to understand, to die, to die to everything that one knows. I don't know if you ever tried it. To be free from the known, to be free from your memories, even for a few days, to be free from your pleasure, 
without any argument, without any fear, to die to your family, to your house, to your name, to become completely anonymous. It's only the person that is completely anonymous is in a state of non-violence. He has no violence. And to die every day, not as an idea, but actually, do do it sometime. You know, one has collected so much, not books, not houses, not bank account, but inwardly, the memories of insults, the memories of flattery, the memories of neurotic achievements, the memory of holding on to your own particular experience which gives you a position. To die to all that, without argument, without discussion, without any fear, just to give it up. Do it sometime, you will see. It used to be the old tradition in the East that a rich man every five years or so gave up everything, including his money, and began again. You can't do that nowadays. There are too many people, everyone wanting your job population explosion and all the rest of it. But to do it psychologically, it is not detachment, it's not giving up your clothes, your wife, your husband, or your children, or your house, but inwardly not to be attached to anything. In that there is great beauty. After all, it is love, isn't it? Love is not attachment. When there is attachment, there is fear. And fear inevitably becomes authoritarian, possessive, oppressive, dominating. So, meditation is the understanding of life which is to bring about order. Order is virtue which is light, which is not to be lit by another. However experienced, however clever, however erudite, however spiritual, nobody on earth or in heaven can light that except yourself in your own understanding and meditation. And to die to everything within oneself, for love is innocent and fresh, young and clear. Then, if you have established this order, this virtue, this beauty, this light in oneself, then one can go beyond, which means then the mind, having laid order, which is not a thought, then the mind becomes subtly quiet, silent, natural without any force, without any discipline. 
And in the light of that silence, all action can take place, the daily living from that silence. And if one has, or if one were lucky enough to have gone that far, then in that silence there is quite a different movement, which is not of time, which is not of word, which is not measurable by thought, which is always new. It is that immeasurable something that man has everlastingly sought. But you have to come upon it. It cannot be given to you. This is not the word, not the symbol. Those are destructive. But to come, for it to come, you must have complete order beauty, love, and therefore you must die to everything that you know in your psychologically, so that your mind is clear, not tortured, so that it sees things as they are, both outwardly and inwardly. 